All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, this is our monthly SUNY online teaching webinar series. And uh, we are joined today by Judy Littlejohn and John Kane. Um, pull up my notes here. So I just want to introduce you briefly to our friends, and then I will turn it over to them to be sharing lots of great information with you today. Um, Judy is the Director of Online Learning at SUNY Genesee Community College. She's also the Chair of SUNY's Faculty Advisory Council on Teaching and Technology, FAC2. Judy provides innovative support for her faculty, and she is a leader in online learning at SUNY. John is the director of the Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching at SUNY Oswego, a professor and the Applied Mathematical Economics Program Coordinator. John also coordinates the T for Teaching podcast, which you may have heard about with his colleague, Rebecca Mushtar, and they host discussions on innovative and effective practices in teaching and learning with leaders in the field. So welcome to you both. Always look forward to what you have to share with us. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to start off with a few slides and then <clears throat> hop over to the support website. So are you seeing a slide that says increasing student engagement and learning and so on? Yeah. So, OK, thanks. Um, all right. So welcome. This is increasing student engagement and learning through authentic assessment strategies and asynchronous courses. But what, uh, what, how this really came about was um, authentic assessment is something we've been thinking about for a long time. And it's also um, another tool I see in our toolbox to combat, uh, well, we'll see. But um, I think it, it's, uh, it's got a lot of potential and we um, talk about this try maybe from two different perspectives, one from a program perspective and one from a general education perspective. So we'll just dive right into there. Um, so the problem that we're, one of the problems we're trying to solve here is that sometimes in our online courses, we see that uh, perhaps some students might be tempted to um, turn to academic dishonesty to avoid failing or avoid low grades, or they might turn to chat GPT or whatever AI tool to do their work for them. Or I think the worst case scenario is if they become completely disengaged and then disappear from our courses. And I think we've all experienced some of this. So we'll be talking a little bit about how authentic assessment strategies can address these by connecting the students' learning activities to things that students value to their lives and to their goals. So uh, the goal here then is to use uh, learning uh, to find learning objective related activities that are intrinsically meaningful to students because that fosters a learning environment that makes it more likely because they value the work, they see the, the meaning behind it, that they feel personally connected to, and it makes it more likely that they'll actually complete the course and persist in their education, which is an area we're all concerned with. And when we talk about authentic assessment, um, some of the, the greatest advantages that I see in using authentic assessment in my classes is that it helps the students can prepare for their future careers um, or their whatever their future path in higher ed might be. It just helps connect the current course content with the students' lived experiences, helps the students improve their metacognitive skills, which I think is increasingly important. Um, and it increases the student's capacity for reflection so they can think about their learning, how they're learning, and um, what skills they want to work on in that regard. Okay, so now, so that's just our little intro web, uh, and now we want to invite everyone to come to our example, um, Authentic Assessment Strategies website, if you'd want to use that QR code and hop over there, and I'll get the and I also put the URL in the chat too. Okay, good job. I meant to get those ready and I did not. And we'll be talking about that both within the context of the online history classes that uh, that Judy has been teaching for quite some time now and to a few economics courses that I've taught, some of them purely asynchronous, some of them in other modalities or some type of mixed modality. I'm gonna slide this over here. Do you see that right? 
We good? You see my little happy person with this puzzle piece? Yeah, that looks good. Okay. So, and this should be what you're seeing at the QR code too, I'm hoping. And maybe John, if you just now and then throw that back in the chat if people join late. Sure. All right, so this is the what I always try to have like what I think of as a support website for any presentation, because when things are behind our firewall at our college, I, it's hard for me to share out. So this way anybody can just go, you can see, you know, these are the same slides you just saw. And the rest of our PowerPoint is kind of embedded in here with all these resources and examples. So it's like a one stop, get all your info URL. So we did the welcome talking about what authentic assessment is. Did you want to talk any more about that, John? Okay, so um, so basically authentic assessment is taking the learning objectives of your course and trying to find ways that students can connect to, things that they're, they're going to be doing in their future, things that they could... Um, or that they see related to their future potential careers and the types of skills that they realize are going to be valuable. So it builds in more intrinsic motivation because they recognize the value of this. They don't see it as just a series of hoops that we're having them jump through, but it's something that is intrinsically meaningful to them. All right. And then we kind of outlined six um, characteristics of authentic assessments that I think John's going to explain to you. Okay. <laughs> I lost track of which, which we were I know. doing. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, <laughs> um, so basically any authentic assessment activity should have some aspects of all these things in it, that there should be a real world context to it or something that at least mirrors the real, real world types of activities that students expect to be addressing in the future. And instead of just having students work through problems that are sort of the can problems that they can easily find online as and have simply solve using AI tools. Um, we want to try to find open-ended questions and of tasks that are those types of wicked problems that cannot be easily resolved, that don't have a well-defined solution where they bring their own critical thinking skills to it. But they should be ones in which they're applying the knowledge and skills that they're acquiring within the course. Because again, the purpose of this is to help them apply those skills and develop higher order thinking skills. And it's really helpful if we can have students approach these things from multiple perspectives, because there are very few topics that students are likely to be addressing that fits entirely within a single disciplinary lens. So it's teaching students that they do have to bring a variety of tools to this. And any authentic assessment task is also one where there's going to be some degree of iteration and scaffolding so that the problem should be set up in a way so that they're getting feedback throughout the whole process so that they're, um, they're able to progress in a reasonable fashion so they don't go off in a direction which isn't very productive, but we're giving them a little bit of guidance and support. And also we're encouraging students to give each other some guidance and support as they work through the process. When um, when I think of authentic assessment and the things that we want the students to do because it's so personalized, um, it just goes hand in hand with UDL, right? The Universal Design for Learning Framework. Um, and I love how Brightspace is inherently accessible as long as we're using the, the templates, um, both the templates that SUNY and Alex's group, because I saw Alex here, shout out to Alex for her awesome templates. And uh, some of the, the thanks Alex, <laughs> the document templates that are built into Brightspace. And when you follow those guidelines, the documents you create or those web pages you create are accessible to our students but also with universal design for learning and authentic assessment, we wanna make that connection between um, having students see themselves in the course materials and have some autonomy when they're choosing um, how they're going to demonstrate their learning. And so they, they all work together. And I think uh, that this is, um, for me with this new LMS, I find this work a lot easier you know, the, the lift isn't as heavy as it was with a previous LMS, and it's just well-suited to put all this together. And also, um, the there's a link right in here if you want to find out more about Universal Design for Learning and the new uh, UDL 3.0 framework that came out this past summer, and which is also pre 
placing a greater emphasis on student voice and agency, which are, you know, foundational to authentic assessment. All right. So, you know, in Bright Space, there are some, a variety of tools that are really useful. You can use any number of tools in there, Bright Space quizzes, Bright Space assignments, discussion boards, peer assessment tools, and project submissions and so forth. And basically, as with any other task, you can have students, you could use whatever task is most appropriate for the type of skills that your students are developing. Uh, Bright Space provides lots of nice features for integrating multimedia. Um, and also, they have really nice rubric tools and tools for providing feedback to students or for students to provide feedback to each other. Um, and again, Brightspace is designed to support asynchronous learning, which is what most of what we're talking about here. Uh, so students can work on assignments and their assessments at their own pace, fitting around their work schedules and other tasks that they have in their day-to-day -day lives. And we'd also encourage people to look at some of the analytics and analytical tools that provide reports on student progress. So you can track individual and group projects and, and provide feedback or nudges to students if they start falling behind. And some of that you can also do with the intelligent agents built into Brightspace, where you can automatically send reminders to students if, if they are lagging behind on some tasks. And again, as Judy said, there are some really good accessibility tools built in to create accessible content so that it, the materials you use can be can work for all learners, regardless of any, um, any special needs they have in terms of accessibility. And then we just included a handful of like types of authentic assessment, just if it's something that uh, you haven't considered yet, or you might be wondering what you can do with the materials you already have to um, make, make some shifts. Um, here are just some ideas. So case studies are a great one. Um, so this example is like in a nursing program, you can give the students uh, like a patient case study with different medical records, symptoms, and history, and they have to do a diagnosis and outline a treatment plan. And these can be, you know, mixed up a little bit and personalized for different students. Project-based assessments. Um, this one is, I really like these. These are almost you know, similar to like a capstone project, right? Where you could, a business student could come up with a full business plan or a marketing plan um, and come up with financial uh, projects, projections and market research and so forth um, based on a business or industry that they are interested in that they would could maybe have a personal stake in and it would tie to some of their future goals. Problem-based assessments um, is kind of near and dear to me, especially in, you know, um, so the example is in an environmental science class, you can have their students go out to um, a local area of environmental concern and gather data and track the data and share it with whoever it, it is in their municipality that they could you know, raise the awareness of to try to enact some kind of solutions in their area. Um, and simulation and role playing, which I always tend to shy away from because I do teach I teach all asynchronously, but uh, actually, and if you think about it, so if you were in a psychology course, you could have students doing simulated counseling sessions with an AI tool. So they could play the role of, um, you know, like your chat GPT could be the patient and you could have the student be the analyst and uh, converse back and forth and work on counseling techniques and interpersonal skills. And they could save that transcript to um, turn in for their assignment. And I think portfolio assignment or assessment is kind of a, a standard, but I think it's an awesome standard, especially when the two, when the students are choosing the artifacts that they wanna share and the ways that they wanna demonstrate their growth over time. And lab work is another one where students can, um, maybe customized to an extent to, to kind of focus the work on what it is that's going to be the most meaningful to them um, and then make their sketches and gather their data and be able to share all that in as they would in any other sort of lab book. 
So I think they're just a few ideas, but it's just, and we have other ideas and examples that we're going to show you in a minute, but I just want to try to get, help people like get the wheels turning a little bit and, um, and see if we can build on that. So authentic assessment by the, by the nature of them are things that are relevant to students. And that relevance is an important reason behind the intrinsic motivation associated with these. It separates the, it allows students to connect the theory that they're learning in classes with real world practice and makes it much more meaningful. And also because they are applying a variety of different knowledge and so uh, knowledge and tasks and things they picked up from other courses as well. They're developing critical thinking skills and and developing ways of creatively approaching problem solving, resulting in deeper learning and improved problem solving skills. And again, this it also provides preparation for the real world that they'll be leaving as they move beyond college, although they already are in the world, real world. But it um, it can be a way of helping them develop job skills that they can mention when they go apply to jobs, that they work through problems of this sort of um, this, this nature. And it also provides a more holistic review a view of a student's abilities than what you'd get on a an essay or a paper exam and so forth. And it prepares students for lifelong learning where they will be addressing a variety of problems. And we know that you know most of the jobs that were around 50 or 60 years ago no longer exist anymore. And many of the job categories we have now didn't exist 40 or 50 years ago. And the way in which the labor market is going to be evolving in response to AI, we do need to pre prepare students even more so now to be flexible and adaptable in the future. All right, how are we doing so far? I don't see any questions in the chat, but if you have any, feel free to type them in there. We're almost to the example. <laughs> so these are just, um, these are some good guidelines to follow when you're creating these authentic assessments in your asynchronous course. So I always imagine that you're not um, meeting regularly with the students in, in you know, in a face-to-face -face way. So you have to kind of get everything out there in a way that they're gonna, um, they're gonna be able to follow through the directions and be successful. So obviously we start with, I say obviously because I'm an instructional designer at heart and uh, we always start with the learning outcomes. So we determine which of your course learning outcomes we're trying to meet or perhaps a program learning outcome um, with a specific example or assessment. And how do we want that you know, what do you need the student to show so that you know they met that specific learning outcome? And embracing real world scenarios wherever possible um, so that they can, you know, relate to what's going on and, and then use this learning experience as something they can draw on in the future. Providing clear instructions so that students understand fully the expectations that you have of them. Um, so they know what they're supposed to do step by step, by step along the way. And as we already mentioned, um, Brightspace has that awesome rubrics tool, and I like to use that a lot. And if, um, sorry, I've got a, a tractor trailer going by. Um, and when you link that to an assignment directly, it, it kind of embeds the rubric right into the assignment direction. So your students can read that while they're reading the directions and kind of get that overview both of what's expected of them and how you're going to be evaluating them. And John also shared in here the tilt transparent um, or transparency and learning and teaching tilt approach. Um, and there's a link to that so you can find out more about that. So again, this is like informational and resourceful, I guess. So we like to foster student choice wherever possible so that the student uh, feels more engaged and um, has more autonomy in what they're what they're choosing. I think I teach history general education courses, and I'm always mindful of student choice because as teaching gen eds, many of the students don't want to be there. They're just trying to get through the course so they can check the box off and and move on to the next thing. But if I can give them all the tools they need to really engage with the course and like track a topic that they love the most or have the most interest in, it, it makes the whole course more engaging for them. So, and then it, that increases the chance that they'll uh, persist throughout the course. And then in Brightspace, it's easy to add um, multimedia elements. This can be 
um, videos that, that you or the instructor makes to explain a topic or add some more context. Um, or can, you could also have the student's final assessment be some sort of a multimedia object where they could make a video or um, something along those lines and upload that as their assignment. And then encourage reflection. We've already, I think we've said that a few times already, but uh, it's, a, it's one of those evidence-based learning practices that we are really focused on and making sure our students always have, take that conscious time to step back and think about their learning process. Um, there and, is a question. Oh, go ahead. oh yeah, go ahead. There is a question in the chat from Stephen Sturman, uh, which is, with distance learning, are there any special considerations you would recommend paying attention to in developing authentic assessment? Yeah, I think that's kind of what we're reading through now, because um, we said, you know, like, this is a, for an asynchronous course, so I don't expect to see the students. I'm not explaining them um, what to them what we're doing face to face so i've got to make sure all these elements are in place so that they know how to be successful um i'm not sure i think one one aspect is just making sure the assignment process is sufficiently flexible to work with student schedules you yeah. know because sometimes people might only work on weekends some people might only work late at night some people might only work in the morning and so on um so i think that's one aspect that you'd have to embed and if you are going to do any sort of joint work, make sure it's set up in a way where students are able to match up based on their own schedules. And we, we'll talk about that a little bit more later, I think. No, actually, you're, you're right. It's right here, like designing for collaboration. So when you do, if you are setting up group projects, um, it's, yeah, it is very important to make sure that students are able to choose who they're partnering with or teaming up with so that they can um, reach agreement on how they're going to meet up and, and what time. So I think that, and to be a hundred percent honest, it, it kind of makes some of the asynchronous challenges kind of make me veer toward other types of assessments than other than group work. And it's something for me, like I need to challenge myself and try to work on having more group assignments. I have this semester implemented um, some debates to see how the debates will go and they have, the students have to consult with each other and uh, make sure they know who's going to address which, which part of the, of the arguments, you know, if they're going to do the, um, you know, a counter argument or a summary or whatever. So that's my um, kind of, my first giant step into a lot of this group work. Other things I've done before in the past, the students can kind of work like through chat asynchronously still, but I kind of wanted to push that more and have the students develop those connections where they are trying to communicate with each other in real time. But, um, and then I think right um, with design, with collaboration, I think peer review is the next obvious step so that students can uh, see what the other students are doing. I, I love when students can share out what they're doing with more than just me. You know, anytime um, that they can get other students' feedback, whether it's constructive criticism or just, wow, that's a cool thing you did. I like that. You know, I, I think students really benefit from that. And, uh, I, and it's great for students to see how their peers interpreted the same assignment that they were doing. So... Those are things that um, that I would encourage people to think about as they're setting up these types of assessments in their courses. Steve, is that helping you? Did we answer you or do you have something else you want to say or wanted to ask? No, um, that was a very good explanation. Um, it, it just seemed like the stuff on the web page is a great uh, description of what you would do for uh, authentic assessment based um, for any type of format. So okay. I was wondering if there was anything in addition to this, which you might have to pay attention to. Like I can see with the collaboration, it's got to be flexible. You might have to show them tools they can use, that type of stuff. Right. Yeah. Like encourage, you know, how are they going to connect with each other? Um, and using, 
you know, in Brightspace, you could use the groups tool, you know, so if you put students in groups, you can have them, you can assign them, or you can have them self-select groups, and then you could put a discussion board right there. So somebody could say, hey, you know, can anybody else Zoom tonight at seven or something like that, and, and just get the conversation going. So you can facilitate or give them uh, the tools to start the conversation and then kind of hope that somebody leads it or to try to nudge them along if you don't see anything happening in, the, in a course. And I'd done something similar with the discussion board where students, I had them students do um, podcast projects where I asked them to post the topics they're interested in and the times are available and see if they can form groups that way. But I always try to leave an option for people who just can't find a time that works. So they, there's an alternative way of doing it or they could do their own, but I encourage them to work together because it does build more community and more interaction. There's another question about specific tools for peer review. Um, I can partly address that. Judy can talk about the, the tools built in, but I've used Hypothesis and you and Perusal could work as well, where when students create work, I upload it there and then they provide feedback to each other right in the in their creation. And that could work with audio, visual work, or it could work with text on work as well. And so, no, there there is not a tool in Brightspace for peer review. It is a it is a kind of a pain point that we have with the LMS. No LMS is perfect. Um, and when I've done them before, if I do formal peer reviews, I have I have had students submit their work as anonymous PDFs, where I assign them um, like unique four digit numbers, so that we can share the PDFs and um, kind of uh provide feedback like in a, a like a Microsoft form type of setup so that they're answering questions about the work the essay that they've read um it's very uh labor intensive on my part and the students like it because everyone loves to fill out a form but um I think uh and then I would always use number 9999 on myself so since everyone knew that so they could see the feedback that I provided too which I thought was valuable because then students could look at an essay that they knew they provided feedback on and compare what they said to what I said and see, you know, where where we merge or where we separate. Um, but honestly, I know the, a lot of the faculty that I work with on our campus use discussion boards for students to share things in the discussion for peer review. Um, so it's not ideal. But let's see if, uh, so Marky Hooper is saying, that you, that you also use discussions in Brightspace. Yeah, students can attach files to their post. Um, and then, yeah, if they're PDFs, anyone can open them and then they can reply. And then, yeah, Marky, that's pretty much what we do as well, I think. I'm just scrolling back to see some comments on perusal. And thank you, Aaron, for adding the links to those tools that John mentioned. Awesome. All right, so we're gonna move on to some authentic assessments in our classes. And I just laugh because I some of these I love with all my heart. Um, <laughs> some of them are okay, but others I just really get excited about because um, I love seeing what some of the students are coming up with. And that's the same QR code that we were already here. So if anybody doesn't know where we are in the internet, uh, grab that QR code. This is um, an example, I, or a little slide I put together for that slide presentation that we started with. And it just shows, um, this is my favorite one with the cat in it. So I'm teaching a course, it's um, modern or modern, ancient Western tradition. And the students, it's a humanities course. So it's really taught from you know the, the cultural perspective. So the students, after they've established that they understand um, <clears throat> what culture is or what it means to them, then they have to look through the first few chapters in the book that we use, which is from Norton, um, and um, pick a cultural artifact that they're interested in and then create a modern representation of that. So actually, the, so the students like literally had to sit at home with you know scissors and glue and tape and paper and come up with their own version of the artifact. And I just love, this cat, because I love cats and the Egyptians loved cats and it was just all perfect to me. But um, we'll circle back to that later. Um, and you can see the 
historic sign. If you're in New York state, you see these all over the place. But so I, I have students in um, modern American history, you know, go out in their neighborhood and their municipality and, and take a look at some of the historical artifacts that they can find. And then a lot of the reflection things, um, I love to use, you know, I always have them say, I chose this topic because, and that's because I think that's, I mean, you can ask cheap chat GPT to say, why did I choose this topic? But I, I don't think that's a common thing that students ask. I think it's a thing that they might pause and answer. And that's what we're going for here. Um, and I like the, I used to think, but now I think statements so that students have a chance to, to say like, wow, this is, you know, this was my preconceived notion or this was my assumption. And now that I've done this research and written this paper, um, this is what I realize. And they can make these connections and show their own learning right there in, a, in an easy statement. And then this other, this fourth one is, how do your personal experiences and observations help you understand the broader concept of culture as both visible and invisible? So I think that's a nice um, question for them to pause and ponder, right? And they have to kind of break down that question and think about what it means, think about visible culture and what is invisible culture and uh, where how are they observing that? So I really like, these are the types of things that I'm putting in my general education courses for students to be able to insert their authentic self, right? And they can choose how they interpret it um, and what sort of topic they're addressing when they're answering some of these questions. Um, and then there's a couple more down here that I put in the on the website. So this is one of those local history ones a student wrote about a factory in Rochester where hearses were made at one point. And of course the Susan B. Anthony house where, uh, which was an early voting location from Monroe County the past couple of weeks. And a lot of people were really excited to be at Susan B. Anthony's house being able to cast their ballot. Um, so then in modern world is another one I teach. Um, I have them, and this is hard to read, and I apologize for that, but they the students have to look at their typical breakfast and think about it in the context of the Columbian Exchange and talk about whether the foods that they eat were old world foods or new world foods and, you know, what does all that mean and where do they come from now? And um, it's just kind of a fun thing to really get students to think about what what they have every day and what kind of historical significance it might have or what... Um, you know, like what led it down this path so that it's in your kitchen cupboard. And so I, I like that kind of thing. And along those same lines, um, the students have to write about consumption. And this student, so here, this student created a PowerPoint presentation about coffee. And she started her PowerPoint off with a table of contents. And the reason I put this here is because like I love this, right? Because if I'm sitting, I've got... I, courses are capped at 32. So I'm, I sit down and I think I got to read 32 essays and grade them. And, you know, depending on my mood, I might not be all that enthusiastic about that. But anytime I see that it's a PowerPoint or a video, I just get so excited. And then I open up and see that somebody included a table of contents. And like, I'm smiling and grading, like smiling and grading, literally, which I never do during an essay. I don't know about you guys, but it just makes it like their personality comes through and I'm enjoying grading. And like, this is what I wanted. You know, when I said, I want to teach this stuff, that's what I wanted was to be enjoying the learning experience with the students. So I think it's awesome, even though we're asynchronous, I'd love to see a student presenting this in person. And when they do their videos, which I didn't put in any video clips cause I don't have, I want to get a specific students written permission first, but, um, if you hold on to the URL, hopefully down the road, you'll see a couple of video clips, but uh, it's just fun. Um, <laughs> and then I had a student, so we're talking about the Fugitive Slave Act of 18, the 1850s, and she wrote a play, like the student wrote a play where um, Lucy is explaining uh, to Miss Rose Percy what the Fugitive Slave Act was and how it affected people. And then she's you know, and they're citing their sources, which is, so they're like, they're still meeting the parameters of the learning outcome. And, you know, they're explaining their topic, they're citing their sources, they're using scholarly sources. 
and uh, and they're doing this in this fun and creative and unique way that they're really engaged with. And and by extension, I'm engaged too because I'm thinking, yeah, just wrote a play in a discussion forum. Like, who does that? And so it's really entertaining to read and enjoy. Um, now, and then here, this is a newer one from um, this past summer. I did a Lumen Circle on. Um, using generative AI in the course with students. And so we had one assignment, we had to come up with our own assignments. And one that I came up with was to have students, wherever you are, you have to ask ChatGPT to give you directions to Boston using the um, roads and modes of transportation that were available to you in 1780. So you can see this, I had a student in Germany who had to, travel, it just says travel by carriage and horseback. He had to go to Frankfurt and then to Cologne, from Cologne go to Hamburg using carriages and horses, as well as river transport where feasible. Then he had to get on a ship from Hamburg to London. Um, and then once he's in London, he had to cross the Atlantic and hopefully land in Boston. And then the students, um, a big part of this too, was you got to think about how long did this all take? Um, what will you be doing in Boston? How long will that take? How are you getting back? And in the meantime, you left your homestead. So you got your family, you got when whatever else is going on there, whether you have crops or uh, farm animals or some sort of an industry and, you know, and, and who's maintaining and managing all of that. And just to try to get it in the mindset of some of, of these people who were migrating or just transacting business and how, like, how did all that really work? How, did this affect people's lives? And um, so I like that one a lot. So the student wrote, you know, this journey would have been lengthy, challenging, and required significant planning and resources. It underscores the adventurous spirit and determination of travelers during that era. So that's that was a good one. And here, you know, here's the cat. <laughs> so um, there, he's creating this modern interpretation of this ancient cultural artifact. So you can see the cat. So he, what he did was he put a pyramid screensaver on his computer, uh, you know, on his monitor. And uh, this is a double crown. You, it's hard to tell because of the clouds, but there's a there's white. It's a white crown behind a red crown. The red crown has a catfish on it, which is um, Narmer, who is an ancient Egyptian leader, and uh, that was his symbol, the catfish. And of course his cat was just lounging in front of his monitor. So he put the put it right on the cat's head. And so he said, I crafted a small scale version of the skent or double crown from ancient Egypt. And I went a step further to make it cat sized. The ancient Egyptians worshiped cats in their culture. So it made sense to make a skent for my cats even if they did not care much to wear it. So you think about the level, you know, like just the amount of thought that an industry that the student put into this. And I know, and it is an authentic assessment. Is it gonna get them a job? No. Uh, well, I, who knows, maybe in the right creative field, but um, it he's engaged with the course. This uh, this course is still going on. We're in week 11 right now. And he he's an outstanding student and he loves the course. And it's like, it's, a, it's an excellent relationship that we have, even though it's asynchronous and I've never met him, but you know, we exchange emails back and forth and so forth. And it's just been really delightful to see what all the students have come up with. I had other students, another student wrote a play again about a, an Egyptian girl who had to sacrifice sparrows to a God because their family couldn't afford to buy clothing or metal objects to offer to their God. And then she, after writing all this, she made a slingshot out of twine as her example. And so it's just been amazing to see how creative the students are, how they're thinking outside the box and what they're coming up with um, in a course that they may not have wanted to take, but they're trying to meet a gen ed requirement. So four types of authentic assessment strategies that I've used in economics classes at the introductory level and intermediate level and as a capstone course have been podcast projects, which I've used in introductory microeconomics courses online, 
introductory um, intermediate labor economics courses online. Um, and I've and also I've done it once in a capstone course. Um, in the capstone course, most often in the last six years, students have chosen to do book projects. I've encouraged them to consider using some type of open pedagogy project, which generally fits in nicely into authentic assessment. And five out of the last six years, they chose to create a book as a whole class project. I've also used a metacognitive cafe, which Judy and I actually jointly developed probably about a decade or so ago. Uh, and I've been using that in my introductory online microeconomics class and my intermediate economics course, uh, my intermediate labor economics course. And basically it's a low stakes discussion forums where students reflect on their learning and on the development of their learning skills as they move through the class, which has this sort of metacognitive reflection that Judy mentioned before. And for many years, I also had gave students the option of uh, if they did poorly on an exam, one of the weekly exams in the class, they could submit videos for that. I did have to curtail that about five or six years ago because I was using this both in my online class and also in the sections with up to 400 students. And I, when I was getting about 100 videos coming in in the last week or so of the semester, it just became impossible to keep up with it. They really enjoyed it, but it was just a little bit too much for me to be able to handle. Um, so I just want to give a few examples of, of these. Um, and I encourage you just to listen to some of these here. Um, there's a, the first link there is to a podcast that was created by an, um, an education major who is taking this as a requirement for her social studies um, education, preparation, secondary school teaching, um, where she's talking about scarcity, but she's applying it to food scarcity and food deserts and some of the inequities she was observing. <clears throat> and she put a lot of passion into this discussion. And it just allowed it to address a concept which in the textbook and in the reading can be pretty dry and looking at some of the real world applications of this. The next one was a little bit later in the semester uh, where they looked at the economics of gift giving and some of the economic inefficiency, which may be one of the reasons why economics gets a bad reputation or reputation as a dismal science. But basically she was looking at some studies that addressed um, how much value is lost when people buy gifts for other people that they don't really know that well. Uh, and she talked about examples of getting gifts from relatives who may not have got, purchased the things that she would value the most. And so it's basically talking about cash versus gifts and so forth during the holiday season. Um, and I did have a longer, um, ooh, and it looks, and it looks like um, this yeah. version lost the, um, the slides that I had put in, um, this happened one other time too. Um, yeah. So I did have another podcast example here on intergenerational income mobility, which was there this morning and last night, uh, but it seems to have reverted to an earlier version of this. And I also had links to some sample student videos and I don't know where they went, but we will add those back into the website later. I wonder if this is cached on my computer here. I bet that's what's happening. No, um, let me see. Oh, you okay. Aaron can see it. Okay. So if you just do a quick refresh, maybe. Okay. Um, I think that should get it back. It's it's a long scroll. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, it is intergenerational mobility in the U.S. Okay, good. <laughs> so, um, and that shows the type of podcast projects that were done in a capstone level course with senior, senior students who were planning to move into the next stage. And you can see they're much more sophisticated. And in each of these classes, students worked in groups typically of two or three to develop two podcasts, one at the beginning of the semester or about halfway through the semester and one near the end. And they were given a, a list of the learning objectives throughout the class and just they just picked one from each portion of the class and built that into this. Um, and in the book projects, it was a really highly scaffolded project. It was inspired by presentation that Robin DeRosa gave at CIT and some podcasts she had been on. Um, and the first 
This class has been offered and sometimes in a, well, typically in a bichronous manner, but it's often been face-to-face, -face, but it, they're still really cool authentic learning assignments. So I'm going to mention it anyway. Uh, and basically the students at the beginning of the class decide what type of project they want to do in the class that semester. Um, and most often they chose the book projects and I had shared information with them before from a podcast I had done with Robin DeRosa and some examples examples of, of open pedagogy projects, which probably induce them to lean towards a book project initially. Uh, and they picked it, they come up with a list of topics they wanted to address that semester. They tried to find a common theme. Uh, and then they broke up into groups. Initially, I let them pick their own groups, but then to be more equitable in the future, I sorted them based on how much background they had in math, math and graphs and the number of economics courses they had taken and the number of math courses. So that way the, the groups were a bit more balanced. Um, and once they had the groups, they came up with, a, as a class, a list of topics. And then I let them do a little bidding process where I gave them 10 votes uh, most of the years that they could allocate among the chapters uh, to see which ones they valued the most. If they were indifferent, they could spread it out over three of the chapters, say, for example, or four of them. Uh, if they really were committed to one, they could bid all of their votes on that. And it turned out that Virtually every group got their first choice or their second choice in each of these occasions. Um, and these were pretty well done projects. They were doing other things in the class too. They were doing presentations. They were doing presentations every week. But it was a really fun project. Um, now, the, I, I could only find two examples of the older videos because I, 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 they were on YouTube and they were publicly shared. I had lots of links to ones that students only shared with me. But these were kind of fun videos uh, that they really enjoyed doing. It, both of them ended up involving songs that the students created in which they were singing about economic topics. And I was really impressed by their creativity there. Um, and I do right below this, I have um, some of the feedback from students about the, the book projects. In fact, this was a podcast describing the book project that students after the semester was over, grades were received and so forth. I asked the students if any of them would be interested in coming back at summer and recording a podcast um, describing that book project. And these were just some selected comments about it showing how students valued the project. <clears throat> And I think the main theme of this was that they were really impressed to have this work, this sample of the work that they could share with, with their family, share with their friends. And they also mentioned that they liked the fact that they could put it on their LinkedIn profiles to show the type of work they're capable of doing. And it was it was a really positive experience. And um, right below that, I just put in a few arguments here about why um, um, why authentic learning activities might be valuable. Um, if you could just scroll down a little bit, you know, this is all tied to intrinsic motivation, that what the work of Desi, Desi and Ryan, Ryan Desi, and a whole host of other researchers in psychology has found is that once people get past their basic needs, then, you know, the basic needs of food, clothing, and shelter, and so forth, the needs for competence, relatedness, and autonomy, and self-determination are really important to human beings. <clears throat> and that Authentic assessments connect to these psychological needs, which creates that sort of intrinsic motivation that makes students want to do it more themselves. And in one of Desi's studies back in 1992, he finds that those tasks that generate intrinsic motivation leads to both more current and future engagement with that task. So there is at least some evidence that by building this intrinsic motivation, it's more likely that our students are going to persist and put more effort and energy into these pro these these activities, which again means they're going to get much deeper learning out of them than if they're just jumping through hoops that are dumped upon them. Thanks, John. Um, and so we added in here, uh, like what might you try in your courses? Like thinking if you were looking, if you're teaching gen eds, yay. Um, you could focus on guiding students toward the value of critical thinking and metacognition and civic engagement, you know, like um, you, projects that they can do for the greater good, right? Like the environmental issues that they could target and things like that. Or obviously if you're teaching program courses, they you could focus on the learning outcome, um, activities that they need uh, 
that will help focus them on their student, on their learning goals and their future educational goals. And let's see. Oh yeah, and Aaron, oh Aaron, that's a good idea. Do you incorporate authentic assessment? Feel free to share your examples in the chat. Yeah, so we wanted you to uh, share what you're doing, absolutely. And if you, if you're be past all that because you're already doing it, then we wanted you to try the uh, assessment or try to open up your chat GPT and ask for directions to Boston, <laughs> but back it up 30 years and ask for the roads uh, and modes of transportation from 1750 and see um, what you'd have to do to get to Boston and back. John added another activity here about economics. And, um, and, but we wanted to pause a few minutes to see, like, did, does anybody want to share what they're doing? Did anybody have ideas or maybe they want, uh, if anybody wants suggestions about with that partially formed idea or something like that, is there anything that you want to talk about or share at this point? There was a question earlier, I responded briefly in chat, and that is that authentic assessments are different than the types of things students are used to, and there's often some resistance. When I introduced a podcast project, um, I gave students a survey because I knew there'd be some resistance to it because whenever I tried something different, students tend to resist. And their main concerns was they weren't sure if they had the technology to be able to record it. They weren't sure about how they'd upload files and so forth. So I responded to that and I started the project with a really simple task where I asked them to listen to a podcast and I gave them a list of four or five podcast series where all the podcasts are about 10 or 15 minutes in length. And I asked them just to listen to one and to use a Chromebook or a laptop and they told them what software to use or their smartphones just to record a response and then to upload it into a Google form. And that relieved their anxiety dramatically once they saw that it really wasn't that hard to do. Nice. And I Casey also really liked uh, Casey's reply to that same question, John, um, about providing an outline about how this assignment or whatever it might be is applicable to their future career in academics. So that direct relationship to uh, the real world example. Nice. And Casey also posted in the chat that um, they have a lot of examples of authentic assessments in criminal justice courses. And anyone who teaches that should feel free to reach out at c.ryan2 at hvcc.edu. That's very generous. And thank you, Casey. So we know we have some challenges and solutions as we do with any asynchronous class. <laughs> and this is just kind of like, this is on our home stretch to the, the summary and final. But, um, you know, things that we're using uh, these types of assignments to help overcome, right? The lack of student engagement, which is what we started with way at the beginning. Um, we are just trying to uh, link what the students are doing to what it is that they're trying to, to get to in their real life and um, help to use multimedia, interactive content, and whatever we can do on our end to make it as engaging as possible so that students will connect with the assignments. Time management is an ever-present issue, I think. Um, but if we're, and I think it works both ways in this, in that we have to give the students clear deadlines or, um, or like checkpoints, if you will, like have so much done by this date and have them check in with you. But often, um, or also make sure that if it's group work, that the students are checking in with their peers um, or and that the students in the group like feel empowered to nudge their peers and say, hey, you know, we're, we're supposed to be this far. How is everybody doing? So um, they can keep each other on task as well. Assessment and integrity is really, you know, it's a it's a hot topic now, I think, every everywhere um, with the chat GPT and the, the difficulty and, um, you know, the plagiarism checkers not really being reliable on for checking with um, AI content and so forth. 
So I think that that's what I like is that if it's as pos as personal to the student as we can make it, then they get excited about what they're sharing. And I think it helps to mitigate the odds, I'll say, that they're using some sort of um, an external tool to do the writing for them. And other, other issues, you know, are diverse student needs. But again, we circle back to those UDL principles and um, the accessibility features in Brightspace. Those can really help with both of these issues, the diverse student needs and the accessibility and inclusivity. Um, so where are we? I know we're running out of time and I wondered, Alex shared an, uh, a link in the chat to um, SUNY online teaching um, online assessments on, on the website. So Alex, did you wanna talk about it or just share it out there and, and let people click on it as they wish? Judy, we have a lot of resources on the online teaching website about um, small group work, authentic um, types of assessments, all different kinds of um, ways to, you know, many of the things that you so and John so beautifully described. We have lots of resources for people to, um, in addition to what you've shared, to take a look at. And But we're having some challenges with our website right now. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but, you know, so I just put one link in there. I could have put a ton, but I, you know, I just put the one in there as a starting point, but. Excellent job. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Thank you. Alex, may we put add this link to uh, the resources on this site to get people to go back and forth? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you talked about time on task and you talked about, you know, supporting sort of some of those self-regulated learning strategies in students and, and then also small group work. And I I have a ton of resources on that for instructional designers and faculty on our website. And, um, but I'm just sharing that link right now because the site looks terrible at the moment. Yeah, the FACT2 website got hit as well. And fortunately, Aaron bailed us out, <laughs> for which we are ever grateful. Yeah, we're working on it right now, but you know, it's a lot of work. There's a lot of sites. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So in summary, we just had a few key takeaways. And Jonathan, do you want to talk about those? Um, well, I think we're probably just about out of time. Um, okay. I know I've got another workshop at one <laughs> right here. <laughs> so um, so they are in the document. And, you know, it's basically oh. just arguing that you consider trying some authentic assessment uh, assessment activities. But wait, there's a Padlet. <laughs> and we did, we did put this out here. Um, so if you have something to share, uh, you know, an, uh, um, an example, please feel free to share it on this Padlet or ask any questions or, or anything. Like we'd love to hear from people. We'd love to see other people's examples. And, um, and um, you know, as Aaron says, we do love a Padlet. Uh, which I'm not that handy with Padlet. So if anything's not working, that's on me. And you can you can nudge me to say, tell me what to fix. Um, but and also just to wrap up the site, we, we do have a list of sources here. Um, and we're going to add uh, Alex's link. And then at the very bottom, you can reach us, email us. Um, and we're more than happy to talk to you if you have any questions or anything you want to share. And thank you. Thank you all for coming and for joining us and listening to us. Thank you. Thank you so much to both of you. There is a lot of great information that you've, um, you know, collected here and aggregated on this page for folks. So we appreciate this as a resource going forward as well. Um, I'm going to put a couple links in the chat here for folks. Um, the first is where you can get recordings uh, for all of our SUNY Online Teaching Monthly webinars. And there is a link there um, for registration. Um, I'll show you the, the uh, list of sessions here. I think you can see that, right? Yep. Um, so here are the list of sessions we've already had. And then next month, um, Alex will be leading the session on inclusive online learning environments and um, speaking about the DEI for All project. 
We do have a YouTube playlist uh, for all of our SUNY online videos. And this week is National Distance Learning Week. If you did not know that, this session happened to fall in the middle of it, which is awesome. Um, and so all of our sessions are at that last link and you can drop in um, tomorrow and Friday with us and join us for um, some more great presentation. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.